this was a great uh, event, uh, which claimed to represent uh, the unity of NATO members uh, and the empowerment of NATO. That's the theme of the declaration. But from a broader perspective, you could argue that it represents the retreat of the G7, Europeans and North Atlantic Treaty partners into a citadel which excludes the majority of the world. Or in other words, uh, puts the transatlantic relationship, the Atlantic community, as it were, at odds with the majority of the world rather than, so it is not an advance so much as it is uh, a, a, a retreat under, under pressure. Hello, everybody. I hope you're doing well. It's my great pleasure to welcome back to the show one of the United States' most distinguished diplomats to talk to us about diplomacy. I've got with me again Ambassador Chas Freeman. Ambassador Freeman served as U.S. Assistant Secretary of Defense from 1993 to 94 and as U.S. Ambassador to Saudi Arabia from 89 to 92, handling the fallout of the Gulf War. He was the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs during the historic U.S. mediation of Namibian independence, and he was Richard Nixon's principal interpreter during his 1972 visit to China, which led to the normalization of US-China relations. Ambassador Freeman recently wrote a short but highly useful piece on diplomatic professionalism, which I wish each and every diplomat in the service of whatever country would be forced to read and internalize. So I thought nobody better the, to talk to about uh, what Hungary is currently doing diplomatically and what NATO is pretending to be <laughs> doing as a diplomatic actor than Ambassador Freeman. Ambassador, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Pascal. Good to be back. Uh, let's talk first about Hungary, because last week on Sunday, when I uh, Saturday, when I heard that uh, Viktor Orban went from Kiev more or less straight to Moscow, which he didn't announce to anyone in order to get some real di uh, peace discussions going, I got very, very excited. Um, what was your reaction and what is your impression since um, also taking into consideration that Viktor Orban also went to Beijing to talk to uh, Xi Jinping? And how do you make sense of this, uh, what has been termed shuttle diplomacy by some commentators? Well, Mr. Orban is a very interesting man. He, um, uh, in the Soviet era, he was widely accused of being anti-Russian. Now he's accused of being pro-Russian. I think he's pro-Hungarian and pro-European. Um, and I note that he first went to Kyiv and talked to uh, Zelensky. And then he went to Moscow. Then he went to Beijing. And uh, he has just been in Washington at the NATO summit. And he has described his mission, self-decided, uh, because he does not, even though he is the president of the European Union for six months, he has no mandate from it to do anything about peace in Ukraine. Um, he described his mandate, his self-imposed mandate, as to connect the warring great powers with Ukraine and to, to jumpstart a peace process. And he noted that in speaking with Mr. Putin in Moscow for about three hours, and he's fluent in Russian, so I assume conversation was three hours rather than the usual interpreted half, uh, you know, half of that. Um, uh, he, uh, he, he made the point, I think, a uh, very important point, uh, that uh, NATO was established to sustain peace and stability in Europe. It was a purely defensive alliance. And he thinks it should be that again. And I agree with him. Uh, and obviously, Mr. Putin would be comfortable with that, um, rather than with the aggressive expansion of NATO and military installations from the United States along with it. The latest development in that regard is the establishment by the United States with the agreement of Finland in, in multiple bases in Finland. Uh, uh, it's clear that, that if NATO were to bring Ukraine into uh, membership, 
that would be followed by the extension of American military presence right to Russians, Russia's borders. Um, I think in Beijing, he found um, a, a welcome in that uh, he, in, he endorsed the basic principles that uh, Beijing has put forward for a peace in Ukraine uh, and in Europe. And um, uh, that was flattering to the Chinese. I note the Chinese have not developed a plan for implementation of that. I believe he talked to them about that. And it's clear that during his six months presidency of the European Union, he will continue uh, to act as an intermediary and to act as a facilitator of the peace negotiations that should be taking place, but which I have not. Uh, I don't think it's accurate to describe this as shuttle diplomacy. I don't think he's a mediator uh, or he's representing the interests of the EU, according to other members of the EU. In fact, he's been quite widely condemned for wanting peace rather than continuation of the war. Um, but I think he is determined to conciliate. And conciliation is different from mediation. Uh, it is the facilitation of uh, dialogue and uh, addressing the interests of the various parties. Um, and uh, he is a facilitator, uh, not, not a mediator, I think, um, in that regard. Um, the reaction from the West has been quite outspoken, like really as in... Um, this man doesn't speak for us. And uh, there, there have even been talks in Politico, there was an article about apparently some of the, uh, um, uh, some ambassadors inside the EU are talking about maybe changing the rules for uh, getting rid of Hungary's prem, uh, uh, premiership uh, for early. Uh, and, you know, the, the reaction just has been so uh, extreme in, in, in my view, and it, which also exposes this, I this European approach toward we will not talk to to uh, Russia. The one thing Mr. Orban did is expose that Russia is more than willing to talk. <laughs> it is actually the Europeans yes. and Western doesn't, isn't willing. Why do you think that the Europeans are so in, in, unable to appreciate what Orban just did for European well, peace and security? I think, I'm sorry to say that I believe it is the pernicious influence of the United States that has produced this um, willing, unwillingness to talk. If you don't talk, you can't solve any problem uh, except with warfare. And the United States appears committed to warfare with the objective, as some impolitic members of the cabinet have stated, uh, of isolating and weakening Russia. Uh, this has not been the result, but anyway, that's the objective. Um, and I think the British are very much in on this, as illustrated by Boris Johnson's hasty trip to Kiev in um, April of, uh, I think it was April of uh, 2022, uh, to put the kibosh on to prevent uh, the ratification of the treaty draft that had been initialed by Ukrainian representatives and the Russians. Uh, and which would have brought the war to an end with the Russian withdrawal, the restoration of autonomy for Donbass, um, Oblast, uh, and, uh, and presumably and a Ukrainian declaration of neutrality that would have restored Ukraine to its original position in European security and perhaps facilitated the discussion of European security architecture uh, that has been missing. Uh, so, um, Mr. Orban um, is being condemned for exactly the same reasons that um, provoked Mr. Johnson to go to Kiev and, and do what he did. Um, uh, so, um, it's very clear that uh, everyone in Europe, except, I suppose, many Ukrainians and the Hungarians and the Slovaks and a lot of voters in elections, is happy to see Ukrainians die on the battlefield in order to weaken and isolate Russia. Um, Ukraine has a problem. It has run out of Ukrainians to die on the battlefield. 
And I think Mr. Zelensky is beginning to reflect awareness of this with his reversal of his position. Uh, in, you know, several times he has had so-called peace conferences, which were actually political rallies on, in support of Ukrainian warfare. Russians were not invited, they were excluded. Now he says, we must have the Russians there. Um, and that, uh, uh, that is an advance, because he recognizes that the only way out of this, short of the dis further dismemberment, reduction, and possible obliteration of Ukraine, uh, is a, uh, an agreement with Moscow. Um, and uh, that would be the preliminary uh, step one hopes in a discussion of, of a wider European uh, reorganization in uh, defense policy. One thing that I find fascinating about the position that Hungary managed to maneuver itself in is not just that they are uh, having the EU, uh, the, the presidency of the EU Council, but they are also a NATO member. So they are at the summit at the moment. Uh, and they were their foreign minister was in Switzerland uh, in the in the peace forum, you know, so they are dancing on everybody's wedding, right? Um, but the NATO one, I have a question, because the, the summit document that came out yesterday clearly utterly condemns uh, Russia and, uh, and then also blames China for whatever, I mean, for, for basically being the motor behind the war. But we, we talk about this later. But the point is, it, this was adopted by all 32 heads of state, which includes Hungary. And I, it, this doesn't square with what Orban has been doing before. Do you have any knowledge of how these summit outcome documents come together? And how, why is it that Hungary um, is one of the signatories and doesn't say, like, no, we are not? Well, Hungary has a very complex history. Uh, Hungary was um, forced into an alliance with Nazi Germany um, during uh, the 1930, 40, 30, 40, uh, the decades of the 1930s and 40s. Uh, it was forced into an alliance with Russia in the Warsaw Pact during the Soviet era of, era of domination in Eastern Europe. It has, it shares the concerns of other Eastern Europeans about uh, Russian domination. It is a member of NATO. Uh, it is not uh, pro-Russian. Um, it is pro-Hungarian. Uh, and uh, given its complex history, uh, it is very sensitive to the risk of a wider war in Europe, because wider wars in Europe historically have dismembered or uh, forced Hungary into positions it would not otherwise want to take. So I think Mr. Orban is very aware of this uh, history, as are other Hungarians. Uh, Hungary, Hungary is a, uh, a, a, an, a, an outpost uh, in Europe in the sense that um, it, is a, uh, it is a basin surrounded by mountains. Um, and uh, historically, before the events that I mentioned, it was, of course, part of an Austro-Hungarian empire. Uh, in which Germans predominated, uh, Austrians, uh, but in which Hungary played an important role. Uh, it has its own culture. It is definitely part of the West. Uh, it is not part of the East, if you will. Uh, and it has a delicate relationship with um, not just uh, Russia, but Germany uh, and, and Poland. And uh, so I think, um, and with Ukraine, by the way, there are 150,000 Ukraine, Ukrainians whose native language is Hungary, Hungarian, who have been deprived, like Russian speakers, of the right to use their language uh, in, and to be autonomous. Uh, so Hungary is implicitly a supporter of something like the Austrian State Treaty, which would produce a buffer state between it and Russia, uh, a neutral buffer state, and would also guarantee the rights, linguistic and other rights, of Ukrainian and Hungarians. Uh, so this is all, I think, not that hard to uh, understand. We are living in a world in which, and here I, I, I jump ahead to your mention of China, it is not the case that if you're not with us, you're against us. It is not the case. Uh, things are much more complicated. And Hungary is not with Russia, but it is also not with the 
war on Russia because it sees the risks. And those risks are mounting. We have now the rest of the summer, we will see the introduction of F-16s in Ukraine. Um, we are beginning to see, I believe, evidence of Russian sabotage of um, munitions factories and so on. I know that the uh, factory that produces the Javelin anti-tank missile in the United States mysteriously blew up. Nobody has pointed a finger at Russia, but if I were a detective, I would put them number one on the list of suspects. Um, we see the Russians now having embraced North Korea um, in a way that would not have happened uh, had um, the United States continued, not continued uh, to um, uh, invite Ukraine to become part of its sphere of influence. Um, and uh, we see, and then there's also a reaction, of course, to the um, massacre on the beach in Sevastopol, which um, uh, caused Lloyd Austin, the U.S. Defense Secretary, to make an unprecedented call to his Russian counterpart. Um, I think Mr. Orban is right. Um, and I think he represents a European tradition of pragmatic diplomacy, which is sadly lacking in current American uh, practice. And that is, uh, you never lose by talking. Talking is a means of conveying your position, tough as it is, of probing the position of the other side, and more important than talking, listening, trying to understand why uh, the discord that exists does exist and how it might be remedied. Um, and so I think Mr. Orban is now the only figure in the world who has talked to all of the parties and, uh, you know, to say that, well, uh, therefore he should be purged is quite ridiculous. Um, let's maybe go to uh, North Korea and also China. I mean, you are a, you've uh, studied Chinese foreign policy for an extremely long time and and in, in depth. So the uh, the one discussion that was missing for me from the moment when Mr. Putin went to first Pyongyang and then Hanoi is what what is China in this in this triangle? Because I, I looked at the, the treaty that they made or that, that was published at least on the North Korean homepage. And the treaty had one interesting clause, which is that if ever one of the two parties has a problem with a third country, then they will not support the third country, which is basically a, a traditional neutrality clause. And the only third country they can mean is China. So do you think that China is happy with this development or this no. could be the seed of, of future disagreements? agreements between Russia and China, no? No, I'm, I'm sure China was not uh, terribly pleased by this. Um, on the other hand, the major Chinese interest in North Korea is to preserve it as a buffer state mm -hmm. against the American-backed um, South Korean government and the U.S. troops in South Korea, which have a history of invading North Korea. Um, of course, North Korea began that, but still... China does not want a war on the Korean Peninsula, and it wants uh, North Korea to remain independent, not garrisoned by American forces, as would likely happen if the overwhelming strength of South Korea were to prevail on the peninsula in a unification under Seoul's auspices. Uh, so that's basically the Chinese interest. The Chinese have also had an interest in stopping the North Korean nuclear program. Uh, but they've been totally frustrated in that regard by uh, the unwillingness of the United States to compromise. Um, we focused on denuclearization and totally uh, ignored and dismissed North Korea's security concerns. Uh, this is a regime which uh, historically, uh, for many reasons, has been very insecure. Um, it, it's a horrible regime, frankly. Um, and. Um, I recall that uh, uh, from discussion with various interlocutors, whom I will not name that, um, when uh, Kim Jong-un went to Bern to school and learned Switzerdeutsch and um, became uh, very fond of Switzerland, um, the 
the reason his father sent him there was that he could not have a normal childhood in a country that is as tense and is divided and combated by factions in the Korean uh, uh, People's Party uh, as it is. Uh, so um, China doesn't like North Korea at all. Um, they remember Khrushchev's dismissal of them during the 1950s as, quote, pantsless communism, unquote. And they apply that honorific to North Korea. Um, and they don't like it at all. And um, the Koreans, of course, North and South, are aware that they've been invaded 72 times in their history, almost always from what is now China. Sometimes not Chinese, but not Han Chinese, but people who are in Manchuria or elsewhere in, in, in North China. So I don't think they were happy at all. But what this illustrates is that the Sino-Russian relationship is not an alliance. It does not have an, it said maybe without limits, but it does not have a, an open-ended commitment uh, to mutual support on every issue. And if you doubt this, consider that Mr. Putin then went to Vietnam, with which China fought a war in 1979 to eliminate uh, Soviet dominance, Russian dominance. And he did this, uh, I'm sure the Vietnamese are very pleased, to have an alternative backer um, or balancer of Chinese influence and American influence. And this gave Vietnam a freedom of maneuver it has not had. And so um, this was a, uh, an effort by Mr. Putin uh, to uh, buttress Russia's own security. He clearly got uh, a su ready supply of ammunition and apparently some troops uh, from North Korea to, to help in Ukraine. Um, and I don't think the Chinese like this at all, but I think they understand it. And um, uh, I think they play a long game. Uh, they're not concerned to dominate North Korea. They never have. Uh, Kim Il-sung, the founder of North Korea, was a colonel in the Soviet Ar Red Army. Uh, this is his, his invasion of South Korea involved seven divisions, which had been pre previously part of the People's Liberation Army in China, Korean divisions. Uh, they were battle hardened. They went through the unprepared North South Korean troops like a knife through butter. Uh, they fought un unready American troops to a standstill. And uh, so... Um, there is a history uh, of connections to China, but the Soviet connection, the Russian connection is much stronger. And given North Korean concerns about independence from China, uh, the Russian connection is enormously desirable uh, to Kim Jong-un and Pyongyang. And I think, you know, this reflects, of course, impasse in Korea between North and South and the fact that Pyongyang has basically given up on Washington. And Pyongyang had also now had this uh, policy shift in uh, in January and during this year, where they basically are saying we don't want reunification with the South anymore. We know where our, no our southern border is. We're going to do our own thing. Uh, South Korea, please leave us alone. Uh, it's more or less almost literally what he said. Um, do you think this will change the 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 dynamic, the political dynamic uh, in Northeast Asia, or will it not matter in the great scheme of things? Well, it has a great uh, deal of potential to do that. I mean, the, the North Korean uh, uh, abandonment of the idea of uh, uh, a negotiated reunification of Korea, not, not a for they have not abandoned the idea of a forcible uh, reunification, um, uh, is very, very important. And um, uh, depending on who leads Japan and what uh, Japanese thinking is, this is an opportunity for Japan, which has its problems with both North and South Korea. Uh, but, you know, if I were sitting in Pyongyang playing this game, if I were Kim Jong-un, I'd look for an opening to Japan. Because I'm now playing a balancing game uh, with everyone I can. Um, and, uh, you know, eventually they will, they will want to have an, a relationship with the United States. In fact, when Madeleine Albright went to Pyongyang, uh, 
the North Koreans told her, we, we don't like China, we want to switch sides. But she was too obtuse and too imprisoned in the narrative to understand what she was hearing. Uh, so this is an independent country, which is determined to remain independent, which wants reunification with South Korea, because all Koreans want reunification in some form, uh, but which has reconciled it to itself to the fact that it's not going to get it in the near future. Um, there's there's one very big uh, uh, chip that they have in their hands with the Japanese, which is this abduction issue, because the North Koreans abducted in the 70s several Japanese citizens, and some of them are still alive in North Korea, apparently, and the Japanese apparently. want them back. If they did that, if they did that, that would immediately change the, the perception. Yes, no, I mean, they have cards to play, um, and um, I wouldn't be surprised to see them play them. Uh, I, don't, I think uh, imagining that they are irrational, as we often do, is, as is always the case when you declare someone else to be irrational, simply a statement that you're not going to bother to try to figure out what motivates them. Um, it's a comment on you and your uh, recalcitrance rather than on theirs. One technical question, but I'm still very uh, curious about how you see this. So we have now several instances in which world leaders, you know, travel to several capitals in order to do, well, call it diplomacy, uh, Viktor Orban, Vladimir Putin. Um, do you, would you categorize this as diplomacy or as politics? Because diplomacy is often said it's being done by diplomats and those people are not diplomats, they are politicians. How would you make, would you distinguish this or not? Well, Mr. Orban is either a villain or a statesman, depending on your perspective. Uh, statesmen uh, are very often involved in diplomacy. Diplomacy is an instrument of statecraft. Uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, the uh, head of a country's government conducting it. I mean, the main problem with summit meetings, uh, if they're ad inadequately prepared, or if those who participate in them are inadequately prepared is, uh, as uh, I think Dean Acheson said, you know, when you fumble, this is an American football uh, analogy, I guess, when you fumble, the goal line is open behind you. There is a reason to delegate diplomacy to uh, subordinates and to reserve your own ability to ratify what they did. But I think, you know, we have seen instances in recent history, for example, uh, Anwar Sadat going to Jerusalem, um, that is, Nixon going to China, where heads of state or government uh, have played an invaluable role in paving the way for further discussions. And that is all Mr. Robin is trying to do. Uh, he doesn't have any illusion that Hungary is in a position to impose a peace on Ukraine or Russia or NATO, uh, but he wants to get a dialogue started. And uh, that is, if that happens, he will have succeeded. And I think it would be very welcome. Yeah, and that is the high art of diplomacy. Um, last last uh, um, topic, the, the outcome document of the NATO summit uh, uh, clearly identified China as a driver of the war in Ukraine. I mean, it, it identified, it blames, it blames um, China and it does something very, very old. It says like, although China is not uh, sending weapons directly to, to Russia, it is exporting dual use goods. And that's very evil. And that's the exact, you know, 500 years of, of discussions about contraband, contraband of war, and just expand the definition of contraband. And that's what NATO is doing right now. It says like, okay, any kind of microchip that can go into a microwave could go into an Iskander missile, therefore it is uh, uh, war material. And this blame is being attributed to, J to China. How do you... <laughs> How do you grapple with this? Well, um, this is obviously an effort by the United States primarily to expand the function of NATO beyond uh, what the treaty calls for, which is a response to an attack on a member, um, to become an offensive alliance, to become an auxiliary of American global primacy. Uh, that is why uh, the United States has made big efforts to in involve NATO in Pacific Asia. Uh, against China. Uh, 
with some very minimal success. I mean, symbolically, Europeans, some Europeans have signed on to that. Um, the practical effect of that is about zero, um, except to exacerbate their relations with, with China. Um, so uh, that's the strategic context. Uh, the effort to expand NATO to become an instrument of global hegemony rather than a mechanism for the defense of its members against various threats, which, you know, um, uh, European perspectives on the threats uh, differ. I mean, if you're in Southern Europe, you're worried about uh, migrants coming across the Mediterranean and terrorists coming uh, from the Islamic world and, um, and uh, uh, a lot of right-wing politics in places uh, like Italy and, and France uh, have to do with this. Um, if you're in Eastern Europe, you're worried about the Russians. If you're French, you're worried about American dominance. You know, I mean, there are, there's a goalist vision of uh, Europe for Europeans. Um, and uh, one of the most striking things about uh, the uh, declaration of the NATO summit that just occurred in Washington is they talk about uh, developing military industrial capacity. But there's no reference to in integration of military industrial capacity within Europe. Uh, this is a, re a, it looks to me like a recipe for the continued dominance of uh, European defense sector by American armaments manufacturers, uh, rather than, uh, you know, bringing Gripen, for example, the Swedish uh, company, uh, into a partnership with others in Europe that would um, add to European strategic autonomy. Uh, I think European strategic autonomy, uh, backed by and in partnership with the United States, would be very good for us, for Americans, and for Europeans. Uh, but that's not what this summit called for. And um, uh, finally, I would just say that we live in an age of information warfare. It has been fierce on the subject of Ukraine. It is even fiercer on the subject of the genocide in Gaza. I just read an article, uh, 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 an account by a young Jewish American who wore a T-shirt um, that said on the back, not in our name for Jews, and on the front, Jews for ceasefire. He was pulled off a Delta Airlines plane for making a, an anti-Semitic statement. You know, his position, which I agree with, is that he was acting as a conscientious follower of Judaism in condemning injustice. Uh, but anyway, this is the age in which we live. Um, disinformation, uh, political correctness, suppression of a dissident opinion, um, and suppression of uh, facts, censorship. Uh, this is what the oligopolistic corporate media are doing. Uh, and it's why uh, alternative views must be voiced on alternative media like your own. Which is exactly what we are doing. And, you know, I remember that you were one of the people like two years ago when I first talked to you who pointed this out. Uh, you, you said that uh, this is worse than McCarthyism <laughs> back then. Um, uh, and it didn't get any better, but it got more obvious, I believe. I mean, it's getting yes. clearer and clearer. And that's why like this NATO summit on the one hand looks like a show of force, but it also seems to me and other commentators, it, it actually shows the cracks and how, how brittle the system is. And also with the information warfare, it seems to, to lose actually grip on the populations, if you also look at what happened in the EU elections and the, the mood in the United States about, about the, the election in, in November, it seems to lose power, that narrative. Um, I would make two observations. One is that um, there, this was a great event uh, which claimed to represent uh, the unity of NATO members uh, and the empowerment of NATO. That's the theme of the declaration. But from a broader perspective, you could argue that it represents the retreat of the G7, Europeans and North Atlantic treaty partners into a citadel uh, 
which excludes the majority of the world. Or in other words, uh, puts the transatlantic relationship, the Atlantic community, as it were, at odds with the majority of the world rather than, so it is not an advance so much as it is uh, a, a, a retreat under, under pressure. Uh, that is one uh, observation. The other is that this uh, summit occurred during a constitutional crisis in the United States uh, in which we have an election with candidates that very few people are enthusiastic about um, or those who are enthusiastic are on the side of a kind of authoritarianism that we have not previously experienced. Um, Mr. Biden uh, looked to this summit to refurbish his very badly damaged image. Uh, I'm the same age as Mr. Biden. Uh, I don't think I should be in charge of anything. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I, I, my wife agrees with, it, with me about that. Um, so um, uh, I think uh, this did not succeed in burnishing his image. And I would note that uh, 10 days or so from now, uh, Mr. Netanyahu will appear in, in a joint session of Congress originally calculated by the Republicans to denigrate and humiliate Mr. Biden, later imposed on the Democratic Party by the Zionist lobby in the United States, Mr. Netanyahu will go to the White House, where Mr. Biden will symbolically kiss his buttocks. Um, this is not a scene that will, will add to American prestige and influence. And uh, as an American, I find it humiliating, frankly. Stark changes happening, stark changes. Um, I do hope that we get out of the weeds. But um, Ambassador Freeman, thank you very much for your time today. And um, we will continue circulating your essays and, and we'll stay in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pascal. Mm -hmm.